What's up? So yeah, pretty much all this tan color stuff and this blue thing is, is going. Gotcha. I'll figure out when the boss gets here, what he wants to carry, what he doesn't. Yeah. So what do y'all make? Uh, we, we do a whole, uh, kind of a variety of things. A lot of tools for like uh, telecommunications, like underground power oh, lines right and uh, phone lines, internet lines, uh, line clearance for like overhead utilities and stuff like oh, okay. pole saws and pruners, do some military lighting. Cool, cool. Kind of, kind of diverse little outfit. So this, this was a scissor department making like splicer scissors for back with like landline, copper lines, phones and stuff. With okay. Big. And everything's kind of fiber now and our snips and stuff wouldn't really cut the fiber so it kind of died out. side of the trailer. So my buddy who hauls scrap all the time asked me to help him on a job he had, which I did, and as a thank you he offered me one of these milling machines. So I thought I'd just uh, show them both to you because they're pretty interesting, I think. This is a Cincinnati Aut 8 or 08 plain automatic milling machine is what they call it. So it's similar to a uh, like a general purpose or a uh, tool room horizontal milling machine at the back here you can see the uh, this motor uh, drives the spindle through this stepped v-belt arrangement and you can either drive the spindle directly or it also has uh, back gears that you can shift it into for extra gear reduction and then it has another motor tucked away behind this housing on this side which powers the table. Now, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it's something to do with there is a mechanical linkage which drives a lead screw like you would find on 
virtually any other milling machine and it is connected and disconnected to the motor via some kind of hydraulically controlled clutches and then the uh, feed rate is controlled by what they call pickoff gears which are behind this cover right here so if you want to change the the feed rate you just take these gears off like that and swap them around you can swap them side to side and then there's all sorts of different uh, different sizes you can get to uh, to change how fast the table moves and then to control the table travel there is this sort of clockwork cam mechanism behind this cover. I am not sure how that works. It uh, somehow or another controls the clutches. Really couldn't tell you any more about it unfortunately, but I've got it uh, plugged into this variable frequency device because of course it's three phase. Let's see here. Run. Uh, if you try to just cut it on with the switch and pull that coil in to start the motor, it will uh, give you an error message for overcurrent, I think is what it is, on the VFD every time. So. I'm just going to kick it in with my foot here, and that turns the spindle motor on. There may just be something wrong with that coil, I don't know, because you can turn the table motor on via the switch over here and do that. Maybe you can't. Um, oh, I know what the problem is. There is actually a safety on this back cover uh, right there. This has to be closed for it to work. See if we can make it cycle. Yeah, there it goes. So you can see these uh, table feed gears running. So yeah, a very neat machine. Uh, unfortunately, it is just hopelessly obsolete. But that leads me into this other machine. This is a Sunstrand single aught rigid mill, also a horizontal uh, auto cycling production mill. The spindle on this machine is driven by this motor down here. It has a uh, chain drive up to a shaft that goes into this uh, gearbox or whatever you would call it. And there are some, uh, some pickoff gears behind this cover that you can change the spindle speed with, and then a shaft that comes out to the spindle to drive it there. The table on this machine is controlled completely hydraulically, so you have this large motor underneath the table here, and it powers two hydraulic pumps. You can vary the displacement manually by turning this square head shaft here, which will also rotate this dial that is supposed to give you an idea of how many inches per minute the table is going to travel. And then the fluid from those pumps, through some uh, convoluted valving and piping, gets pumped into a hydraulic cylinder that sits di directly beneath the table there. And that actually pulls the table to and fro. So you can kind of see this valve here, which uh, we broke the handle off while moving it, unfortunately. It says stop, feed, and rapid. And when you move it, it has this uh, mechanism here and then these uh, things that clamp onto the table that I guess control it. Not exactly sure how it works, but uh, that's the general idea. All right, I've got this one plugged in. Let's see what happens if we try to turn it on. Uh, stop. Start, maybe? All right. You know what? I bet it's turning the wrong way. Hit reverse. Oh, look at that.
is jammed. Okay, I think uh, what's keeping the table from moving is, uh, well, you probably can't even see it in there, but there is a little plunger that's supposed to be popped out, and then whenever I moved the table the first time, this angled bar here moved in and pushed it in, uh, and then it didn't pop back out, so it's stuck in there. And then there was an identical one on this side that was popped out, and then I pushed it in because that's what you do when you troubleshoot something you know nothing about, I guess. And now that one is also stuck in its bore. So I tried hammering on it a little bit. Um, that did nothing. So I think this valve block is going to have to be disassembled to uh, get those out and get them cleaned up and moving freely again. I do uh, not really have any time to be working on this right now. So I am just going to find a nice corner to stick it in and revisit it at a later date. This one, unfortunately, is going to the scrapyard. The uh, last shop that actually used them tried to sell them and nobody wanted them. The most important factor that went into the decision of which of these two machines to keep was the fact that I will probably end up doing nothing with it other than taking it to the scrapyard myself. And this one weighs about 500 pounds more than that one. So yeah, I will, uh, update this later. It's a few months later and this thing has not fixed itself so I'm gonna try to take this cover off and see if I can get access to maybe free those plungers up. Okay. That might be the back of those plungers right there. Try tapping that forward. Oh yeah, look at that. I really want to fix the handle before I put that cover back on. And the only way I can think of to do it is to kind of just drill this hole a little bit deeper and tap some more threads into it to thread the handle into. just drilled that deeper and tapped it. I think that'll be fine. As long as nobody crashes into it with a forklift again, it should be all right. All right, this plunger on the left is definitely free. This one on the right is still a little bit stiff, but I'm just gonna see if it'll work anyway. This thing down here that controls the table feed rate and I think now it's working right. Yeah. Oh cool, alright. Very neat. So it rapids, cuts, rapid return.
with it a little more just to make sure that the table would go through its entire length of travel and it does so yeah awesome love it when it's an easy fix like that i went ahead and moved it outside so that i could pressure wash it now normally i would never condone pressure washing a machine tool but in this particular instance I think it is justified mostly just because of how insanely dirty this thing is also I really don't think it's gonna hurt it the table is all hydraulically controlled there's no gears or bearings or anything in there that are gonna get damaged if they get wet the spindle drive has a bunch of gears and bearings in it but it's sealed up pretty good so I don't think it's gonna get much if any water in it and either way if it does I'm gonna take it right back in and run it for a while to flush everything out also someone painted over the ways so you don't have to worry about those rusting if you listen carefully, the first time that I ever cycled the table, you can hear a loud pop, and I'm pretty sure that was actually this piece of cast iron breaking off of this cover back here because there were so many chips jammed up behind it that it couldn't push them out of the way and it just snapped that chunk off. I think when you're to the point that the machine is so dirty that there are pieces breaking off of it, you're pretty much justified in cleaning it by whatever means necessary. This is going poorly. Pretty much every working surface on the machine here is caked up with what I can only describe as chip mortar. I guess it's just tons and tons of ancient chips that have settled in there and rusted and locked together and they're pretty much the consistency of asphalt. I mean even the air hammer. Kinda can get them out but that's what I'm having to do and they were all in the t-slots in this drain uh, down under here going that way towards the coolant return I've got it pretty well dried off and back in here so let's see if it still works can't get the quill to go in and out it's supposed to have like a like an inch and three quarters of travel on it and it won't move for some reason so this is the lock for it and it's free um, and then this is to adjust it and it's also free it won't move so I took the bolts out of this cover or whatever this is and I'm gonna try and take that off and see what I can see I think it might come off if I just do this Uh, that looks fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. After much hammering and swearing, I finally got the quill out as far as it goes. What I ended up doing was first uh, knocking it in a little bit, and then I guess that got it loose enough to where by heating up the casting around it, I was able to force it out with the adjuster. I'm just gonna take some steel wool and see if I can clean it up and get it to move freely. I messed with it a little bit, but I couldn't really get it much freer. It does move, but you have to really reef on that adjuster thing. So I decided that the quill needs to come all the way out so I can clean it up properly along with the bore it rides in. So I took this nut off the back of the spindle here. That was a huge pain in the butt because as you can see, it's all goopered up from people hitting it with a chisel over the years and the threads were kind of messed up so it was super tight but I did eventually get it off which made room for this big gear to slide back on the spindle so I pushed it as far out as I could with the quill adjuster and then I tried everything else I could think of with the tools I had to knock it out the rest of the way but despite all my prying and hammering and heating and swearing it didn't want to budge so I broke down and bought one of these little 10 ton porta power rams and I think that is going to be just the ticket. The fitting that came with the ram was a different size than the fitting that was on the hose I had so I had to resort to some very janky plumbing that hopefully will not explode under the pressure I'm about to subject it to. Oh yeah.
Oh! The good news is the quill is out. The bad news is this came with it and I don't think it was supposed to. So I guess this is part of a pin that is meant to keep the quill from rotating in the housing, which in hindsight makes perfect sense because like I said, the quill is supposed to just float in there. So if you don't have the quill locked tight, then it could try to spin I guess. Anyway that pin was there and I didn't know and I pressed right through it. So hopefully you can kind of see up in there it sheared off and gouged a big track through the top of the quill bore there unfortunately. In hindsight what you are supposed to do is slide the overarm out and then you can pull that pin up out of that hole right there. So that really sucks I feel pretty stupid but I actually don't think that's the end of the world. I think I can clean everything up and uh, might even be able to just clean up the end of this pin and reuse it. And I think I can just kind of gently file off the burrs inside the bore there and it should still be usable. I should confess at one point I did hear kind of an ominous cracking noise and I did stop and check a few things but I didn't see anything obviously wrong so I just kind of ignored it and kept going which obviously I shouldn't have done. And I got it pretty well cleaned up. Let's see there just used uh, a Dremel tool with a scotch Bright pad on the end of it for the bulk of it. There were a couple of raised spots that I actually used a sanding disc to kind of grind back down, like right here where I was pushing on it and right here where that pin broke. I tried to go a little bit lighter on the bore because it's probably a little softer being cast iron. I just smoothed that gouge out as best I could. I also went and got a new nut for the spindle. Local bearing place had it for $5, so that was kind of a no-brainer. I've got it basically back together, but I'm not sure if the bearings and the spindle are set exactly right, so I'm just going to try running it a little bit and see what happens. This is the only cutter I have that fits this thing, so I'm just gonna see what it'll do to this piece of scrap steel.
Might as well try a second pass. I guess you could call that a cut, or maybe just a gouge. The only cutter I've got for this thing is this weird form tool that I think they were using to cut serrations into scissor blades with, and I'm sure it's quite dull and I have no means of sharpening it, so that's about as good as I'm gonna be able to do right now. When I got this thing, I kinda of thought a use for it would eventually materialize, and it kinda of hasn't. I guess the problem is it just can't really do the same things that a normal milling machine can do. For instance, you can't cut on the Z-axis because there isn't a tapered gib in either of the ways to keep them snug while you move the head up and down. Now you can cut a little bit on the Y-axis by moving the spindle in and out, but you only have an inch and three quarters of travel on that and it's really clumsy to do. I guess you could probably improve that by making some sort of dedicated handle for it, but it's still not going to be as good as uh, just a regular mill would be. And of course you can cut all you want along the x-axis, but really only if you want to cut all the way through something. There isn't really a provision to stop the table in an exact spot without fiddling with these uh, little trip things here a whole lot. So while it is a really cool piece of machinery, I just don't have enough use for it to justify the floor space it takes up. So I think I'm going to try to sell it and hopefully someone else needs it more than I do. Something interesting that I neglected to show before is this uh, so-called phase converter that I whipped up to power this thing. This is actually nothing more than a three-phase electric motor. There are a lot of good videos on here about exactly how these work, so I won't try to fumble through explaining something that I don't fully understand anyway, but suffice to say it is extremely simple to make one of these work. It was actually easier to wire this up and make it function than it was to make that variable frequency device work. And in fact, I did this because I already had the motor and I didn't want to spend $200 on a variable frequency device for this mill that is probably worth about $200. And also because it's not a best practice to run old electric motors on a variable frequency device like that. It's something to do with the waveform of the alternating current that an inverter like that puts out that tends to uh, cause more vibration in the windings. And that can be especially harsh on older motors that may have uh, degraded insulation on their windings and weren't really designed for that sort of power in the first place. But anyway, uh, I think the most complicated part about making one of these work is getting it started. There's a lot of ways to do that, some more complicated than others. I chose to simply wrap a strap around the shaft of the motor, and uh, if I give it a yank to get the motor up to speed, like this, and then cut the single phase power on before it winds down, uh, it'll run just fine. As it spins around, it automatically generates the other two phases that are needed to power the mill. But yeah, I just wanted to show you that. Um, in case you were thinking of making one yourself, you absolutely should because it's the easiest thing in the world and I honestly can't believe I've never done it before now.
worked out well. Uh, I sold it to those guys for $300. They said they did have a specific use in mind for it. Not exactly sure what it was, but they mentioned something about some parts that they need to make every once in a while, and they were looking for a mill just like that to make them with. So I think it went to a good home, which is cool. All things considered, it was probably not really worth the time and effort I put into it. I think if I had taken it to the scrapyard, they probably would have given me about $200 for it, but it just seemed like too much of a waste to scrap something that was still functional like that. Um, and in any case, I just thought it was a really interesting thing to mess with, and I hope you did too. Thanks for watching.